Hey there, I'm Joel Jameson. And I'm Howie Clark. And in this week's episode of Eight Weeks Out TV, we're gonna give you a whole new way to look at the knee. All right, so welcome back. And today, again, we have Dr. Jerry Ramajita back with us after uh, last week, you really just kind of explored the foot and ankle and I know, uh, took a look at, your, look at mm -hmm. your dorsiflexion. Yeah, I mean, I was blown away when he talked about you could have up to a 20% loss of power. Um, uh, and in any athletics, 20% is, that's ridiculous. Game over. That's game over. But I mean, even little increments that we try to improve, whether it be strength and conditioning or, you know, any aspect of improving your, improving your performance, a couple of percent is what's going to make a difference. Yeah. So um, I was kind of shocked to see where I was at. Well, this week, uh, we're going to take a look at a little further up the chain. We're going to look at the knee. And what I really like about his approach is just the, you know, the idea that little changes, little micro movements make a big difference on your macro movements. And today, so we're going to be, like I said, moving up, looking at the knee. Uh, he's going to tell us a little bit more about how he evaluates the knee and something that most people don't think about. And uh, it's going to be great. <laughs> so last week, we uh, talked about the concept, or I introduced that concept of micro movement dictates macro movement again. Tribute that and that th thought process to Dr. Givoye again. Process or process? Uh, where, whatever side of the border you're on, that's <laughs> your, your choice. So, with the knee, we know that by its construction, the medial condyle of the femur is is larger and longer than the lateral, and that has impact on the knee mechanics when you go from flexion to extension. It creates a rotary movement. Everyone's everyone knows that the knee acts like a hinge and flexion extension is the primary movement. But it's really the, the, the internal and external rotation in that joint that allows for that full range of flexion extension to occur. And it's something that often is forgotten. So go ahead and lie on your back for me. So as a basic assessment, it's, it, what we do is we just bring the hip to 90 and the knee to 90 and we get a grip around each malleolus. So I, I can got my finger coming to the medial malleolus here, the, uh, my thumb on the lateral malleolus, and I'm just getting a sense. I, I turn, and I, uh, what you want to make sure is you, you're not getting movement at the ankle joint, and you turn internally, and the other way to look and ensure that you're getting the tibia is that the tibial uh, tuberosity is moving. So it says in the books, if you look, it can be anywhere from 20 to 30 degrees of internal and 40 degrees of external. And uh, you're doing pretty good, so nothing major to find there. Um, there is an exercise we will show that uh, can help with that. The reason it becomes important as well is that if you, if you don't have the, that internal and external rotation as you go through flexion and extension, it increases the compressive forces on the meniscus. So ultimately what will happen over time if you lack those ranges is the meniscus will start to wear. And you, you, I mean, many athletes suffer from meniscal tears. They can be acute, but a lot of times it's just the gradual wear and tear. So again, 90, just checking for the quality of internal, quality of external. And you know, in this position, you can even use that as a, as a mobilization. You can easily just gently take them in and work it a little now, bit. Now, going back to last week, uh, maybe just give us a little bit insight of how those micro movements of the foot could maybe affect the movement in the knee. Right, or vice versa. Uh, you know, when, when we were talking about the major movement of the foot being pronation and supination and being a combination of all the joints of the foot, the, the forefoot, midfoot, subtalar joint contributing to that. Likewise, if the tibia isn't internally rotating properly, it's, it's very hard to get controlled pronation of, of the foot uh, because that, that tibial internal rotation has an influence on the rear foot. If the tibia is moving properly, that will influence how the, how the ankle joint moves. Um, so if you're lacking in terms of your tibial rotation, it can often what you'll see with some people is a very quick pronatory moment where they go from supination really rapidly into pronation. Um, and it can be attributed to uh, poor tibial movement. The other thing about the knee, which is often forgotten is the patella, the kneecap. It kind of sits there and everyone knows it's there but never gets much attention. There are a number of ligaments which attach to the patella and kind of keep it in its anatomical position. And it's, it's good just to get to have them with the leg relaxed 
and then just get a general feel for the quality and smoothness of that movement kind of medially and laterally and, and up and down. Often what you'll find is that in one direction that, that uh, patella doesn't want to move. And as a result, that alters the proprioceptive information in regards to movement in the knee, which again will have influence on muscle firing patterns. Uh, often the VMO, we talk about VMO inactivity with knee issues. What we've seen with working with athletes is that when the patella cannot move freely, is particularly from medial to lateral, it kind of um, involving the medial ligaments that's, that um, provide support to the patella, uh, that lack of movement often correlates to lack of activity within the VMO. So just something to think about. And Aisha, there's a simple exercise or, or a drill that we can have athletes on their own do to, to improve. Yeah, just to improve the tibial mobility, or at least to see uh, how, how they feel when they do that, and uh, it, it'll help to improve mobility. Great, let's, let's uh, check that out. So we've been talking about mobility of the knee. Uh, previously we spoke about mobility of the ankle, and we're going to speak about mobility of the hip in future. This is an exercise that kind of encourages an increase in mobility that uh, will work for all three joints. So what we're gonna do, how he's supporting himself with the hurdle here. And we're going to have him have a, uh, a slight degree of dorsiflexion, um, some knee flexion here, and then slight flexion at the hip. And then he's in a nice upright posture. And then what we're going to have him do is he's going to swing that front leg and he's just going to go into internal and external rotation. Now you can see what's happening is he's getting nice internal rotation at the ankle and external. He's keeping the foot controlled, so he's not rolling the medial border up, he's not rolling off the lateral border. He's keeping the foot on the floor, which will then allow nice movement about the ankle, and you can see that. You can see the knee is going through internal and external, which we, we were assessing earlier, and it just encourage, it's, it's just a nice controlled way to allow for that motion to occur. And then likewise with the slight degree of flexion in the hip and the way he's opening up, you're getting a nice movement into in both internal and external rotation of the hip. So you can do that, you know, have an athlete do that 30 seconds to a minute, and it's just a nice way of get hitting both foot, ankle, knee, hip, uh, even spine. But and and there, you said there are some athletes that you would not recommend do this exercise, Yeah, right? if you have someone that ha already you, you know they have a significant ankle injury or they have some issues in the knee uh, that has not been looked at and assessed and this being checked off with uh, a provider. The only risk there is because we're encouraging internal and external rotation, if uh, there is any type of mechanical issue restricting that, we don't want to risk causing more injury to the knee or uh, potential issues with the meniscus. So just got to be careful with that. Other than that, you're good to go? Other than that, should be good to go. That's something you do every day, every other day? How often would you do that? In that controlled manner, in, in a nice, easy motion, and uh, within the, kind of the limits of comfort, you don't want to push it or go faster or go crazy with the range, but you could do that daily. Nice. Uh, well, thanks again for coming. And uh, like you said, next week we're going to be covering the hip, talk about how this all ties together and works way up the chain. Um, so thanks again for watching this episode of 8 Weeks Out TV. We'll have more again for you with Dr. J R Jerry Ramajita next week. Most coaches and athletes really don't understand what conditioning is or how to develop effective training programs to include it. And the truth is that conditioning is often the difference between winning and losing. You know, conditioning seems to be given short shrift and nobody speaks about it with confidence like he does. I created the BioForce Certified Conditioning Coach Course to solve all these problems and more. I've done tons of other certifications. Nobody does this. I've put over 15 years of work and understanding to give coaches a step-by-step -step guide to maximize performance for each and every athlete. I'm taking a lot with me, so I, I couldn't write fast enough. So. It was great. It really fit in well with my schedule. Joel's information is so valuable. With my clients, the results that I got were amazing. I never thought possible. This is the key to winning. This is the key to success. Just beyond my imagination. <laughs>